Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. Well, tonight, um, um, this is a standalone talk. We're used to doing uh, series, but as I said uh, in the announcements, this is an opportunity to kind of look at sort of an overview, in a way, of the spiritual path. And what I put on your seats this evening is something I've never really done before, which is um, give you my talk before I give you my talk. <laughs> And uh, I don't know if that's a good idea or not, but, um, but I really thought that because there's so many, it's a long list, and I didn't think, you know, that you could handle it by just be listening and being a part of it. So I'm just giving you a walk away piece of paper or a paper airplane in the making or whatever <laughs> it is for you. But it's an opportunity for you to really kind of rock. Where are you in your spiritual path in a way, like, what elements are you incorporating? Have you been through over the course of your life? And let me just say, a spiritual path is not just um, a selected regimen, and it's not just a book you read, and it's not just a group you belong to. A spiritual path is really the, uh, what you were born into and what your entire unfolding of your life um, has revealed in your spiritual life, because spiritual life is not separate from your physical life or from your emotional life or from your psychological life. It is, it, it is encompassed in all of those things because we are multidimensional, but we are not compartmentalized beings. We are saturated in spirit and our spirits, and we are div divining the, and, and growing our souls with life experiences. That's why this is such an important, powerful opportunity for us to be in physical form in this 3D weirdo bipolar, <laughs> bipolar world. <laughs> I never thought of it that way, but I think it is. It's kind of like, you know, it is. It's like duality. It's two different things coming at and co creating conflict. And, and really, it's in the juice of conflict in our lives that, that lightning bolts break loose, that power happens, that spirit gets revealed. And so um, there's nothing more powerful, I don't think, than a human life, and that's how important and powerful it is to be alert to it. And so what I wanted to talk to you about tonight is that in all the messiness of your life, and no matter how challenging your life may be right now or has been in the past, or how painful, that in fact, there is um, a promise that's been made to you, that if you work with what happens, as if, you, um, if you come open-hearted and less defensive, um, more willing to, to learn, or more willing to forgive, or more willing to make amends in your life, as you are willing to learn how to do something differently, how to speak your truth as you know it in a moment. As you begin to do that, there are benefits that will start to be reaped in your life, and you do not have to wait until a moment of nirvana or enlightenment or realization or the end of the path or heaven or whatever you've been taught or you believe might happen you can, every step of the way, begin to reap the harvest of that courage and of that experience. And so I wanted to kind of really um, give you this opportunity to, to take a look at where you are in your life and to embrace per, what may be for you your next step. The most important thing to understand about the spiritual path is that it is always marked by an experience of peace. There's lots of wonderful benefits, but peace is the goal. Peace is the goal in every 
condition or situation that you find yourself in, you have, will have arrived in your um, understanding of at least this dynamic at this moment when you can feel at peace even if it is not peaceful all around you. Maybe even when it is least peaceful around you and yet you can touch peace. When peace becomes the best you can do, you know, I'm at least at peace. I don't like it. I didn't choose it. I don't want to see that person again for the rest of my life. But you know what? For right now, I am at peace with my part in it, and I feel at peace with what has happened. And I think I understand how I go forward from here. You see what I'm saying? Peace is the goal. Peace will always be the, the goal. And, and peace cannot be achieved by ego thinking or by ego manipulation, or by outsmarting somebody else, or by doing it better, or by getting the drop on someone, or being prepared, or being, um, 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 you know, being prepared for the worst case scenario that does not bring you peace. None of that, none of it brings you peace. Peace comes only by the power of the Holy Spirit being realized in you, truly. And when you feel at peace, you know you've got a hold of something real. So I, I give that to you as a touchstone for you to consider that whatever will bring you peace, you may not win the argument, you might not you know, be recognized as being right, um, it may not solve everything in your life, but when you get to a place of peace, you are okay. You will have wisdom. You will know the next step that's right for you. So the spiritual path is geared to create an opportunity to live in peace. And so the tools that we use in the spiritual path are, as Reverend Michael talked about last, last Sunday, is meditation. The opportunity to move into a time of prayer or to move into um, a practice of separating yourself from the distractions of the world and moving into the interior world. Meditation, any form that you practice, and there are, as he said, many different ways, many different forms. There's a lot of things you can, you can experiment with and find your own particular style, your own way of doing it. But it, what it is in its essence is to separate yourself from the, from the distractions of the 3D world and from the self-talk here, which doesn't mean you ever stop it. You, you can't stop it and you shouldn't try to stop it. You just ignore it. You just let it, you let it do its thing and you focus someplace else. It's, to me, it's kind of like when I sit in meditation and I'm breathing in and I'm bringing my focus, I like, to, I, I like to go into my heart and picture it as a big room and that it has a back wall and the back wall comes open and it shows me the universe. That's what I like. And so, and, and there's light there and there's color and there's other things and I just kind of go there for a bit or just a white light, I just allow white light to just kind of be with that and let that be my focal point. And when I remember something I forgot to put on my shopping list, and I, oh, I should hop up and do that right now because I've been meaning to do. And when I realize that, I just take another deep breath, and kind of like you do a two-year-old child that you said to sit on your lap, and the child pops off and starts to walk away, you grab it by the hand, you bring it back, and you sit it back down, and you say, this is what we're doing now. And you go back. You go back into portal through to the universe, and you spend some time in quiet meditation, just opening yourself and allowing yourself to be lost in whatever is your focal point, your word, your mantra, a sound, um, a, an idea, a word, whatever it is that, you've, that you're holding. And every time you wake up or every time you find yourself, you know, distracted, you just take it by the hand, no fault, no shame, Bring it back, sit it back down, go back again for the allotted time that you've planned. 
And this is what we call meditation practice. That's what it is. It isn't meditation perfection. It is meditation practice. And we just keep doing it, and we keep doing it, and we keep doing it. And you will be feeling the benefits of that every single time that you spend any amount of time out of your ordinary world and in, your, um, in, in the non-ordinary world, the extraordinary world of your soul. Meditation practice is a part, prayer is a part of the spiritual path. Seeking counsel is another part of the spiritual path, and that can take many forms. When I say seeking counsel, I mean deferring to someone who has more wisdom than you have. That's how you choose them. You don't choose them because they owe you something and they're going to agree with you, or that you find all the people who love you and are going to tell you you're wonderful no matter what, which is okay if they are also able to tell you when you're not doing the right thing where you went off the beam, right? If they can tell you the truth, they are the ones to defer to. They're the ones to have around you. The other thing around finding counsel is having someone, as I said, that has more wisdom than you have and, or lives a life you would like to have, right? I wish I could live like that. And that's the person to listen to and ask if they could advise you, if they would be willing to be a, involved with you in your, in your spiritual path. Um, a teacher who is a spiritual teacher, uh, a therapist, a, a therapist that works, I mean, you can pay these people, it's okay. It's okay to pay your spiritual guru. If, if you know somebody who's good, that's the person to really find, that's the person to defer to, the one who can tell you the truth and who knows more than you know. Seeking counsel so that you practice deferring. That's a way for your ego to be trained not to be making all the choices anymore. You can also find that in, in a group of people who are also involved in their own spiritual path. And as they are um, committed to their spiritual path, you can learn so much more by their experience as well, even while they may not be much further along than you. Some will be, some may not be. But the whole experience of it, the whole energy field that a group who is committed to a certain practice really can be uplifting to the, to the individuals, to everybody. It, it sort of um, accelerates the process for everyone. In 12 step, um, you know, in my experience in 12 step, it was really powerful to come along with people who were really committed to their process and trying to heal and trying to learn and grow and sharing the truth of their lives and the latest insight that they had and it lifted me every single time. And in this particular 12-step group, of, like most, you may not talk at all, but I, there were times when I came away with so much more than any time I ever spoke or any time I ever shared anything from me. Just hearing what the process was like changed me in the process. So find yourself counsel, a higher a higher experience than what you have. Speaking the truth. Become dedicated to understanding what capital T truth is. By that I mean there are times when it's important to know what my own truth is, what my Karen Tudor's perspective is. This is my truth, but that's little t truth. And there's times for me to share that when I'm negotiating or when I'm, um, when, I'm, when I'm trying to come to reconciliation with somebody in my life, I need to say how it feels to me and what it looks like to me. And that's not an absolute truth, it's just my truth. But it needs to be said, and I need to have the courage to be able to speak it. At the, uh, on, and listen to the others. I have to be able to listen to their truth, and that's how really we come to an understanding. But capital T truth comes to understand the harder truth sometimes, the big truths, that maybe I don't even want to be true or I don't want to know. But I realize the time has come that I have to face this truth and I have to speak it. 
And so that takes another level of courage and another level of understanding and soul development to be able to speak when we feel that we may not be welcomed to do so. But it becomes imperative that when we know something, that we share it. That becomes our part to play in the world. So practicing and understanding what is true and how to recognize it by um, um, you know, a felt sense and practice in, being, in realizing when you have struck a across something that is deeply true. You can do that in your spiritual reading. You can do that as you, um, as you share your heart with somebody else. You begin to realize what deeper truth really feels like. And when you recognize it, then you'll know wh what it is and how to share it. Practicing forgiveness. It is in every spiritual tradition. It is in every spiritual path. It is the most powerful tool you will ever use in your arsenal of spiritual life. It is the most important one. And if forgiveness is still gets stuck in your throat and you're still like hoping maybe today it won't be forgiveness that you have to do, <laughs> let me say this. Substitute the word forgiveness for letting go. Forgiveness has a lot of baggage, a lot, a lot of baggage, and we have a lot of hang-ups around it from things that have happened to us in the past. But if you just simply think about how can I let this go, you may find that you, you're closer to knowing the answer to that question than how to forgive it. It is the same thing. Letting go is letting go is letting go is letting go. And our lives as human beings are simply a series of letting go. From the moment that we let go of our mother and came through the birth canal, we have been letting go ever since. And we will continue to do that with not only everything in our lives and this body as it continues to change and I let go of my dreams and expectations about it. <laughs> soon, soon I hope. But also people who I have come to know and love and people that um, I, I cherish and, and those that I don't want to see go. And so there is a continual letting go and an inevitable sense of separation or loss that is really temporary and not really capital T true because our love will always connect us for, to everyone that matters, always, forever. This is also capital T true. Our love is that connection that umbilical cord that connects us to everything and everyone good. Practicing forgiveness, practicing letting go, becoming clear about what is it that matters the most. Making amends is the next one. Making amends is a way of recognizing that not only do I sometimes have to forgive other people, but I have to go and ask forgiveness of things that I have done. I have to be responsible. I have to admit when I'm wrong. And I have to learn how it is that I clear that relationship, at least in as far as I have the power to do that. That doesn't mean I can make somebody forgive me or that my work isn't done until they do forgive me. I'm not um, locked into um, um, this um, intransigent experience with another person that is based on what they do. It, is only, it only matters what I'm willing to do from my heart, not just what my words are, but from my heart. That I want, I've asked forgiveness, I feel heartily sorry for what I've done. Please let me know how I can make it a difference to you. How can I make it up to you? And I ask for your forgiveness, and I understand if you're not able to give it to me. 
And then I do the work to make sure that I never let whatever it was, the uh, mis mistaken idea or the um, hubris or the fear or the jealousy or the anger or the whatever that I did in the moment that I acted out of, that I will not do that again unconsciously. That I will make every effort to be aware of my own internal thermostat and take the appropriate actions and say things in as more responsible a way as I can. That's how I make amends. Reconciliation is something that happens when two hearts change. And sometimes all it really takes is one brave person to set it in motion and wait. Service to others. Service to others is the other um, piece of the spiritual life. And service to others has a broad, uh, I think, sense of ramifications. There's a number of ways that making a, um, having service to others can look like. It can look like taking care of, you know, a family member near at home or a, a service where you, where you're, you're helping somebody else, a neighbor in your, in your area. It can be somebody that you're entrusted to or raising a child or watching a child after school for a couple of hours. Some kind of service that you do for, from your heart that you just give. It can also be as big as something that directs the whole of your life because you're so committed and your soul is on fire to do this holy work to do something powerful that makes a difference in the world, and you are motivated by that. And you serve the world through this gift and through this set of skills that you've acquired because it matters to you. And we call that sometimes a career. We call it um, our, soul, uh, our soul's passion. Or it can be something as simple as always being alert to what somebody around you might need that hasn't asked. Service to others and being in service to others is selflessness, but not self, um, self belittling or self destructive. It is always using the best of oneself to give out of a sense of love. It is egoless, but it is full of the power of your love. Service to the world. This is really why we're here. This is really why you chose to come into this experience, to be refined, to be transformed. The spiritual path is that unfolding. But it's all for purpose, to let your light shine, wherever you are, however you are. Because this is what brings the glory of God into visibility. This is us. This is who we are. This is what we do. And so I said earlier that you're promised, you're promised some of the consequences of this holy life that you're li li living. And I'm going to tell you now something that came out of my 12-step experience, um, was introduced to me, I should say, through my 12-step experience. And basically, following the spiritual path, know that the gifts of that path arise naturally. They are a natural consequence. And when the, um, when the 12 steps were, of, of Alcoholics Anonymous were first d devised and, and sort of um, um, elucidated by the lives of people who were alcoholics trying to help other alcoholics and went through the process of of trying to find their way to sobriety and trying to support one another, they didn't have a map, and they didn't have 12 steps, and they didn't come down on tablets of stone. What they did was they had to do, go through lived experience, and they discovered that those who found their way to sobriety had things in common, and they began to write those down. And that's how they arrived at the 12 steps that include all of the pieces that I just said and put it into other terms, but that's basically it, because every true spiritual path includes those six things in one form or another. 
But what they also realized is that as they centered themselves in the experience of sobriety, they also began to see a difference in the life they were living now. Because it wasn't just sobriety. It wasn't just sober life. It wasn't just no alcohol. That other manifestations and amazing abilities and an amazing senses and, and feelings began to arise in them that once again they could codify, they could talk about, they could, they could recognize in one another. And that's what I've given you tonight on the piece of paper that you have. And you see it in the bottom half of the page where it's the 12 promises that are numbered. And so this comes from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, pages 83 through 84. And now I'm going to invite you, if you would, to take that page. We're going to read the 12 promises aloud because let me tell you, these are your promises too. These are the promises that will come through your experience of, of you know, being committed and um, dedicated to your own spiritual unfolding. And so I'm going to invite you just to drop the promise one, promise two. We're just going to read the statements together. And we're going to start with the um, italicized sentence right above. So if you would, together. If we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past, nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity. We will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Can you feel the power of that? And for some of us right now, I know that there are words on that page that seem so far away and so unlikely. But I promise you, every one of those statements can come true in your life. And so I um, support you in finding your path and finding the ways that suit your soul and to take the next steps that are obvious for you to find your path and to find your way. Because this is your time. This is who you are. And this is the promise made to you, waiting to be realized in your life. May you do that. God bless you all. Mm -hmm. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.